Hello there and welcome. This is Hugh here letting you know that episode 9 of the Friendly Podcast is about to begin, an online multimedia project made possible by the support of Ireland Yearly Meeting. Over the course of this series, I've been sharing a range of interviews with folks from both home and abroad to hear and explore what makes us friends today. First up this time, we say hello to Johnny Wiggum, who attends Churchtown Meeting in South Dublin. First off, he tells me his earliest memories of being involved with the local meeting. Oh, I suppose um, meeting in Churchtown when I was very young. Um, remember Sunday school particularly. Um, we had sand trays for making models and things, and um, that was quite exciting when you're a tiny child and then our family moved to Waterford and we the meeting house in Waterford was a very old big building um, a little bit intimidating some of the friends there were very old style people but it was an interesting um, time because as it was part of Newtown school most of the Quakers and some of the others um, used to go to meeting. So there was quite a lot of youngish people there. It was rather dull during the summer holidays when there was just us kids and maybe one or two other kids. So um, there was a difference, an interesting difference um, that time. Uh, shortly after we moved to Waterford, my grandfather died, and he was a very well-known businessman. In and there was a there was a meeting uh, for worship for his his funeral, and um, half the congregation were outside, which was quite interesting, because they happened to be Catholic, and they weren't allowed to go into any other church other than the Catholic Church. And uh, it struck me as very, very odd at the time, but uh, this was what happened. And thank goodness today, the same thing wouldn't happen. Later on, of course, um, what is, uh, as a, a youngster, young um, JYM was quite a thing. And JYM in those days was pretty big. I think I've seen a photograph. It was probably the year before I went to JYM. And I think there were about 60 or 70 young friends at it, which was quite amazing. When I was there, I suppose there were probably about 40. And I'm sure, I don't think JYN's anything like that these days. Um, as a, a sort of teenager, or later on, I, I wasn't involved in, in friends very much. But then coming to Dublin, um, to college and later on to work, I joined in Dublin Young Friends, which met in Eustace Street uh, every Monday. And that was a, a great way of getting to know people. And through that, got involved in Irish Young Friends. And Irish Young Friends was sort of yearly meeting of young friends. And we had all sorts of activities. We went on holidays to the west of Ireland. Um, as you probably know, uh, there are quite a lot of Quakers have um, cottages and houses in Erislana, in, in Connemara. And we succeeded in persuading the owners to loan us the cottages. And then about 30 of us all descended on the west of Ireland on one time, and another time we rented cottages in Donegal. So there was lots of activities, and I was clerk of Irish Young Friends for quite a while. And unfortunately, in the early, the mid-70s, it was kind of the end of the baby boom, and there was a dearth of Young Friends coming on, and Irish Young Friends kind of came to an end then and really didn't young friends nationally didn't really get going again i suppose until simon lamb in the 80s 
started getting them together again, which was a shame, but that was it. Was there a huge void when that happened, when Young Friends activities sort of stalled? I think there was, but um, at that stage, um, I was clerk at the time when it came to an end, um, but I'd been married for what, six or seven years, and I really felt I didn't want to continue it on, but there was nobody, nobody there at all in that period to take over. The stage when I was in Irish Young Friends, there was enough of them to be able to organize themselves and were very much ran on sort of uh, committee lines and it was a good training for, for uh, friends committees later on. One other thing is Irish young friends used to be part of yearly meeting and had their own yearly meeting meeting. Again, mainly yearly meeting was held in Eustace Street and Dublin Young Friends had a room at the top of the house, top of the building. And um, at yearly meeting, we would gather together for lunch there and hijack one of the visiting um, visitors from overseas or whatever uh, to come and talk to us. And that, that was quite interesting. We had some very interesting people. Um, I remember particularly, there was a British friend who was governor of a, of a prison in Britain. And he was talking about his life as a, as a governor. And there were things like that. I think it, it, it later came on to, I mean, I got involved with the Dublin Peace Committee, Dublin Monthly Meeting Peace Committee. And also at the time, there was the Yearly Meeting Peace Committee. That was just the beginning of the troubles in the North. And we were very much focused on seeing what we could do there. Um, later on, I can't remember why, but the Yearly Meeting Peace Committee kind of lost its way, but the Dublin one continued um, trying to, to understand what was happening in Northern Ireland and um, having public discussions on, on it. Can I ask, what was it like living and working in Dublin in the 70s and seeing the troubles unfold up north? I suppose in the 80s, the Dublin Peace Committee was very much involved in East-West relations and the CND. And we, we would have meetings with the representatives of the Soviet Peace Committee and on occasions, uh, people from America involved in peace activities. I remember being in I was doing a, a course in Kevin Street College, a nighttime course, and I remember hearing one of the bombs, I think it was the bomb that unfortunately um, killed a, a, a bus driver. But uh, it was a bit kind of uneasy, but I, I wasn't in around Dublin when the, the the big Dublin bombings happened. I don't, I, I, was, I was working. But I was there the time of the um, Derry shootings. And that, that, was, that was a bit frightening. What happened was the following, I was working in uh, Lamb's jam factory at the time. And the local parish priest invited everybody the following day to come to a prayer meeting in the Catholic Church. So everybody in work went over to that and it was very, very full. I returned to work and fortunately nobody else did. 
they all walked into town and that afternoon uh, the British Embassy was burnt out. And that, that was really quite a worrying time as you really didn't know what was going to happen. You wondered whether, I mean, things were very, very tense. One had a feeling that there might be reprisals for, for that. But um, it weren't, but it was, it was quite tense at that time. Yeah. It was one occasion, um, one of the directors of, of LAMS um, was working late on a Saturday afternoon. He drove out, he got out of his car to lock the gate, and he left his briefcase sitting on the driveway. And uh, the next thing we knew, the whole place had been cordoned off, and the army came and blew his briefcase up. Because they thought it was a bomb. <coughs> so that kind of thing was happening. And what do you appreciate about the business method that we do have in the early meeting? One of the, the most important things about our business method is actually writing the minutes at the time and agreeing. Now, I, it's my feeling that if that was standard practice everywhere, there'd be a lot less trouble in the world. <laughs> it was quite interesting. Um, in work, um, I was involved on the periphery of union negotiations between unions and management. And my suggestion was that the union people should start drafting minutes of the meetings at the meeting. And um, what not appreciated by management because they actually rather like to suggest things at one meeting and then not exactly deny that they ever said it at the next meeting, but kind of try to change the emphasis. So <laughs> that had an interesting effect. And that, that's a very useful thing. And also the, the sense of the meeting, I think, is sometimes very, very frustrating. I wish people would vote and that would be it. But the sense of the meeting is, is, is very important and that those who disagree are willing to go along and accept that the sense of the meeting isn't the way they would like it and they will accept that. Are you conscious of how much the early meeting has changed over the years? One of the enormous changes is the early meeting was nearly always in Eustace Street when I first started going to the early meeting. Occasionally it moved to other places, but nearly always in Eustace Street. It was considerably more formal than the yearly meeting is now. In, in the sense, there, there, there weren't the, or it was unusual to have special interest groups and things like that. Uh, when it first, went there, there wasn't actually a, a sale for um, IQFA, well, there was IQFA didn't exist in those days. There wasn't sales for, which would have been for um, French Service Council or QPS as it was later on. Um, and that, that's another, actually, now that I mentioned that, that's another interesting thing is it was a much bigger tie up with Britain yearly meeting or London yearly meeting as it was at that time. Over the years, I've been on a number of um, London yearly meeting uh, committees uh, involved. Um, Quaker Peace and Service had a um, committee that was involved in East West relations meeting um, and had contacts with uh, people in Russia and in America and um, trying to build up East-West relations. Um, that was a very interesting one. And even in Dublin, we 
the Peace Committee was doing the same kind of thing. We hosted both Russian and American visitors in Eustace Street uh, talking about uh, peace. And we also visited both the Soviet embassy and the, the American embassy in the same kind of thing. So, um, oh yeah, the other QPS committees I was on, there was a QPS committee that was involved in Northern Ireland, trying to trying to uh, figure out what might be done to make things better in the north. And then later on, there was QPS and friends in Ireland set up Quaker House in Northern Ireland, and I was on that committee for quite a while. So it was an interesting tie up between the two, which isn't there at the moment in the same way. The trouble with Eustace Street was that it hadn't had any serious maintenance done on it for, I suppose, the best part of a hundred years. <laughs> that sounds a bit dark. It did, it did get um, an upgrade sometime just about the 1900s. And, um, but it really didn't have, there was never the money to do anything more with it. And it was in very poor condition. And it was way, way bigger than we needed. So the decision was to, to downsize. But it was an amazing place. And as a friend, one could get a key to it. So it was a great place. And there was a car park at the back. So to go into town, you could park in the car park and do whatever you wanted. And that was great. Except when somebody parked across the um, gateway at the entrance to it, which occasionally happened. But also as we had young friends, we were able to go in and out as, as, as we desired, which was super. In terms of church town then, how do you find calling that meeting home these days? Church town is kind of, um, it's kind of my family. And um, it's, it's nice to keep in contact with them and it's, it's nice to hear what people have want to say. Are you conscious of how the testimonies play a part in your day-to-day -day life? But they're not really rules, they're, they're just there in the background. So things like um, in peace is, is one that I've been involved in a lot. Perhaps not so much in the, in the last 10 or 15 years, but um, up to that I was probably on a, continually on some kind of a peace committee um, since the very beginning. Uh, Honesty and integrity, I think, are very important. It's, I found that as part of, being, part of being in work, that's actually a very useful thing. Um, in trustworthy. Um, I was just thinking today, one of the things that I found in work was I, I worked in laboratories. If I wanted to borrow a bit of equipment from somebody else, I actually never had any problem borrowing it because they knew I would give it back to them. Uh, whereas a lot of people would borrow something and dump it in the cupboard or whatever, forget where they got it from. But everybody knew I would give it back. Another one, honesty wise, in work was admitting when things went wrong in the search. Quite a number of people used to try and hide what was wrong because they didn't suit the project they were on. And that was never a good idea. But um, no, it was, it was important to be honest when it didn't work. I'm just thinking that the number of times I have uh, been called for jury service and that kind of thing, um, I've always made a point of saying I will affirm. Actually, 
it was interesting. The number of times when I've been called for the jury, and I said, I'll affirm. And one of the barristers had said, they didn't want me. I don't quite know why, but <laughs> that was an interesting one. And just finally, have you ever thought much about what makes us as a group of Irish friends unique? Yeah, you can say they're unique. I think every, having, having seen quite a number of different groups of friends around the world, I think they're all unique in their own way. Friends in Ireland have this a slightly different history from friends in Britain and have traveled in a slightly different way. I think one of the, I think that makes us makes us a little bit different. I don't know that unique is the right word, but certainly there are a lot of differences. Next up on the list of conversations to share is one I had recently with Liberty Britain. Liberty is a young adult friend who is based in Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, but is part of New York yearly meeting. I first met Liberty as part of the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage back in the summer of 2010. It's been over a decade since we last saw each other, so I was eager to find out how she views that experience after all this time. I remember how hard but also rewarding it was to have a full hour of Quaker meeting every day. (laughs) It was uh, at the time just very difficult to have that much silence every day, but also I felt as that month moved forward, I grew to enjoy it more and more. Um, But yeah, I mean, I have great memories of sleeping on the floors of meeting houses with everybody in their sleeping bags and getting to see new parts of the country that I'd never seen before in Seattle and and Portland. So it was a great one. And can I ask you about your uh, history and relationship with Quakers up to that point? Uh, Were you fairly active in the the local meeting? I was, yeah. My my mom and dad were both very active in the local meeting uh, in Manhattan. Uh, The meeting is called Morningside Monthly Meeting. I really grew up in that meeting. I started going to childcare there when I was just, a, you know, just a small kid, and um, everybody knew me. A lot of them probably still see me and think of me as the six-year-old running around. Um, and then I actually, you know, after I started teaching first day school there too, when I was a little bit older, uh, when we, you know, finally had another kid in the meeting, it was when I was eighteen and this, you know, small child was four. Um, I also used to go to Quaker youth uh, weekends at a place called Powell House, which was in upstate New York, um, weekend Quaker youth retreats. Um, so I had a pretty good history with Quakerism. I identified as a non-theist friend, and my father and I had taught a workshop at Friends General Conference, which is the, the U.S. gathering of unprogrammed friends. Um, my dad and I taught a workshop on being a non-theist friend and what that means. So. I'd done a fair amount of hanging out with Quakers, thinking about Quaker theology, (laughs) um, and yeah, being being involved in the community. What do you get out of meeting and that very spiritual setting, that sort of uh, deep meditative space that we try and look to every, every week? Yeah, I think the energy between people, because it's very different than uh, approaching it as meditation, even if, you know, you go somewhere um, like a yoga studio or something where people are going to do meditation together, it still feels the energy is different. It still feels very individual versus there is just something very connected and uh, energizing between all the participants of being in a Quaker meeting. And do you find that it's hard to sustain that during the week when you're not looking actively for a group of people who are sitting in silence for a prolonged period of time. I think it's hard. It is hard. Like you said, Um, I don't know that I always do. And I think sometimes, you know, it just comes in that moment of realizing I'm kind of flustered or I'm, I'm a little bit um, just like worked up and I don't, or anxious or something like that. And I just have to remember to kind of like take a breath and center myself. Um, And then those kind of brief moments are where, get that connection back to like what it feels like to try to sit in meeting and try to center myself and co- and push thoughts to the side to really be present 
in in meeting. And just in terms of where you are in your life now, um, how would you describe your relationship with with friends? I guess just it has it's ebbed and flowed. Um, I think I've always felt very close to my community of Morningside meeting in New York, um, but obviously I live in Philadelphia now, and so not having access to that that specific community has been has made me feel feel more distant from Quakerism. Uh, when I moved to Philadelphia, I attended a couple meetings, a couple different meetings in Philadelphia, a couple different times, but never quite clicked, never felt like it was really um, just kind of a group I wanted to continue to come back to. I think some of that had to do with just the age of the people in the room and feeling like I was the youngest person by 15, 20 years every time I went. Um, so I think uh, it's, you know, I haven't had a connection to a physical meeting in a while, but over the pandemic last summer, I did start zooming into um, my meeting in New York again, which was really great because that is more the community that I felt centered with. But do you think there's an unwritten rule where it's okay still to be a Quaker and not attend meeting as often as others or others who are older than you? Absolutely. I mean, I think that unwritten rule uh, absolutely exists, especially for younger folks who are moving around a lot. And, you know, I'm still fully a member of my meeting in Manhattan. I've never transferred membership. I've never let membership lapse. Um, so I still enjoy having that. And and I, I take pride in that. But yeah, I've never felt like I found a secondary home to, that I wanted to actually transfer my membership or anything like that. And then just in terms of the testimonies, do you find that there are certain ones that speak to you more than others? For example, is it is it easy to try and live a simplistic life these days? That's a good question. Um, I think, I mean, the testimony of peace and equality, I think, speaks to me the most, especially as, you know, I've really felt that growing up Quakerism instilled a drive for social justice and political activism. And uh, that's really been centered on those two testimonies of, of peace and equality. And you know, now as a lot of people in the US talk about equity in instead of equality, something that's maybe more based on everybody's specific means and needs. So I remember you posted on social media about eight, 10 months ago, maybe at this stage, um you were caught in a you were caught in <laughs> oh how do i say this you were on tv yeah so the the protest that i was at when i was on tv was for walter wallace jr who was a young man murdered by the police in philadelphia um so that and that happened in october which obviously is just a few months after the murder of george floyd in minneapolis and the uprisings that occurred across the country and the world over the summer. Um, and yeah, I mean, my reaction to Derek Chauvin being found guilty is that that's absolutely a good step. It was a necessary step. It was absolutely the right call. Uh, it's something, it was a murder we all watched with our own eyes. Uh, he should absolutely be found guilty for it, but it doesn't do anything to change the underlying fact that black people in the U S are still being murdered every day. And, just an, you know, just a few hours before the Derek Chauvin murder uh, trial verdict came in that he was guilty, um, Makia Bryant, who was a 16 year old girl, was killed by the police in uh, in Ohio, I believe. Um, so, you know, it, it hasn't changed the underlying factors. There's a lot more work to be done. What are the quantities that are needed to be a good activist these days? Um, I think anybody can do it. I think. Um, just a feeling of wanting to make the world a better place. And I think that's something that Quakerism really instilled me with, um, that growing up in the Quaker meeting that I grew up in, um, a lot of people were politically active. You know, in my Quaker meeting, there was a group of uh, women who worked really heavily in our prison, in, the, in one of the prisons locally, uh, ran Quaker meeting there. And we had some formerly incarcerated folks who, after leaving the prison, joined our meeting. and. Um, so obviously, you know, in the U.S., 
Um, the prison industrial complex is massive and largely targets black and brown people, especially black and brown men, uh, keeps them in a cycle of, uh, of poverty and of um, disenfranchisement. So that was really, I mean, it's all very connected to why I'm now uh, politically active. Um, you know, I think I have felt somewhat let down in the last year in terms of how my Quaker meeting has reacted um, or just been slow to react to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I feel like when I was searching for ways to get involved to be politically active, you know, the Quakers were not at the forefront there. They were not the group that I could go to and say, how am I, this is how I'm gonna get involved. This is how I'm gonna be connected. And that was a little disappointing, to be honest, a little frustrating. So do you think then at a bigger, broader scale that there needs to be a structural change from within yearly meetings or local meetings about how we interact with wider social justice climate issues? I think in the US, um, Quakers, especially because we tend to be a white organization um, and slightly probably tend to be a little bit older too, just have a lot still to kind of grapple with in terms of in terms of a history of racism. Let's be real, the whole country hasn't dealt with the history of racism in a, um, in a very complete way, but I think Quakers as a community still have work to do on that front too and have a lot of just hard conversations to, to have internally before they can have the conversation on what is our response gonna be to Black Lives Matter. They have to have more internal conversations first about what does it look like to, to be anti-racist within our own organization, our own religion. And, um, you know, for instance, there was um, Friends General Conference is doing a, uh, they're doing a contest of, of t-shirt designs. And there was one t-shirt design that was, had a beautiful image of a couple of women um, who I think were meant to be women of color, you know, cultivating something, um, growing something, farming, and it had a William Penn quote. And William Penn was a slaveholder. And so what does it look like to juxtapose that image with a quote from William Penn? And um, so there was a conversation happening on Facebook about it, which is, you know, honestly not the forum for, uh, for a really meaningful discussion, but it does bring to light just the fact that, um, but those conversations are still still ongoing and still necessary. Young people being engaged with these sorts of political issues, how important is that for young people to be active and be vocal? I think it's very important. I think it, it you know, the protest over the last summer, um, the Black Lives Matter protest really did skew to a younger audience, um, a younger group of people. So I think it is important for, for younger folks in this country who've seen, um, who've had these conversations, who've been confronted with these crises earlier in life and are getting involved. And I do think that has to do with why sometimes Quakerism doesn't hold on to its younger members as tightly as it could. You know, and I've, I've also felt um, a kind of, you know, with this, especially the specific movement, the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening and the conversations around needing to defund the police in order to support local communities, having more funding for schools and social services, which are things that are actually gonna Get, that are going to help people and have more fully functioning communities and especially communities that are mostly black and brown people. Um, you know, I see a hypocrisy there between so much time and effort being spent lobby to defund the military, but then people freeze up when you talk about defunding the police and they don't see the kind of connection there. And I, what seems to me are um, testimonies of peace and equality if they tell us to fight against this bloated police or this bloated military budget they should obviously be telling us to fight against this bloated budgets of our police <laughs> you know biden did not run on defunding the police or, or even really in any meaningfully way promise to to change or uh, you know hold police accountable he i mean him and trump in, in one of the debates got into a whole argument about who has more police backing so he's not gonna be a figure that's going to, in any meaningfully way, I don't think, um, begin to address this problem. Um, I think it's still gonna take movements of people getting organized, demanding change, uh, and really putting pressure on, on local governments as well to make changes. Do you think that location has, a, has an impact on 
on successful activism in terms of where you're located and where you're uh, where you have access to to government organizations and you know NGOs and things so in one sense of just you know this country is vast and there is you know huge kind of political differences that tend in different areas of the country and different circumstances that lend themselves more towards people you know leaning towards progressive politics versus more conservative politics in that sense maybe but I think um, you know really one of the things that I personally feel like I've learned over the last summer of organizing is it took the, you know, this massive Black Lives Matter protest, um, the large that is, you know, surpassed the women's marches as the largest mar the largest day of protest in the country. Um, it took that just to have a murderer found guilty. It hasn't led in any place to largely substantial change yet. Um, I have a lot of hope that it will. But I think what I'm getting at is um, there still can be an escalation, which is, you know, people organizing in their workplaces and organizing work stoppages to, you know, demand that um, the police, that the police budgets be defunded, that we, you know, have serious conversations about this. And that's something that can happen anywhere. That's not something that has to be done, you know, in Washington, because that's where, you know, Biden currently is, or, um, you know, in Philadelphia, because that's where you're, you you want to talk to the, you know, the head of the police there. That's something that can happen across the country. You know, every, um, these, you know, the police murders have been happening all across the country. And I think, you know, especially as the movement talks about ways to win the demand of defunding the police, work stoppages and strikes and labor organizing have to be part of that conversation. There must be a, a huge link between that sort of work and the work that you're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. It must be symbiotic in some ways. Not actually. <laughs> As my day-to-day -day job, I work in um, nonprofit fundraising. I just got a job as a at an animal shelter, which I'm very excited about. I'm very passionate about, about animal welfare. Um, you know, I used to work in an animal shelter. It's where I got my dog. Um, but I am also, you know, in my free time part of an organization called Socialist Alternative. Um, we're a national and international organization. Um, and I think, I mean, that's that's where my work really is with the movement, the movement for Black Lives and my political activism at this point. So my day-to-day, -day, you know, work that pays the bills is kind of just fun, ideally for furry animals. And then <laughs> it's a, <laughs> it's um, on my own free time time where I get to really dig into to the social justice and political activism that I do really feel called towards. So is it an animal shelter specifically for dogs or is it a whole range of things? Dogs and cats. And do you feel you must learn a lot from dogs and cats in general? <laughs> I love I think as being an only child and growing up with a lot of pets I just love animals. <laughs> And so is it a big shelter that you work for? It is a pretty prominent shelter. Um, it's also prominent for the work that they do providing low cost veterinary care to the community because um, it's very important to this organization that uh, we prevent animals from becoming homeless because of exorbitant veterinary fees or um, just people not being able to care for their animals, not being able to you know, provi or provide food and um, food anymore, things like that. So we believe that if we can provide that low cost care for people in the community, we can prevent those animals from becoming homeless in the first place and then needing a shelter to take them in. I personally love kittens. I love, so we get a lot of um, bottle feeder kittens, which are kittens that are too young to actually have been separated from their mom and are still nursing. Um, and so you have to feed them with bottles and they're very, very cute. When you feed them with bottles, their little ears wiggle as they, as they drink from the bottle and it is precious. You must learn a lot from animals though, like just in terms of how they adapt to the world that they live in. Yeah, they are, I mean, resilient creatures. They really can go through horrible experiences and then find a new owner and just find love and find beauty in the world all over again. <laughs> Do you find when you're working as, um, or engaged in the political activism sphere that it's almost like an obligation or a responsibility to keep up with what's happening in the world? Does that get tiresome after a while? 
it can feel emotionally depleting, definitely, to read about, you know, bad things that are happening in the world. But I think having a political organization that I'm connected to where we're discussing solutions and we're discussing it together and we're trying to move forward and figure out how to make the world a better place, um, it always, it ends up being more fulfilling than ultimately depressing. I think when I, before I joined a political organization and I was reading about everything bad happening in the world, but not feeling like I had a place in the solution or I knew what the solution was, I think that was more emotionally depleting and depressing. So how do you deal with that then? How do you deal with that? Trying to stay positive about the future and cultivate a, a positive a mindset. Um, yeah, how do, you, how do you counteract that? I think by having people to talk to about it and to say, okay, what is the, what do we think are the ways that the world could be a better place? What do we, how can we win the demand of defunding the police and fully funding our communities in Philadelphia? How are we gonna accomplish that? And I think for me, it's just that mindset of trying, of being solution oriented. And, and even when it um, is really difficult to plan that protest or um, talk to your coworkers about something going on uh, because you need their support, we, uh, have about have about 1,200, so 1,200 in the country. And gosh, I don't know how many globally, but we have um, organizations in over 40 countries, I wanna say. So it's so a large organization internationally. Makes you feel a part of something. Do you think it would, be, it would be very different if you were in a different country at the moment? You know, looking at what's happening in the States from afar and how you might react to it differently or not. Um, I thought it was really interesting to see, interesting and inspiring to see how many other countries uh, had actions around this, had protests around the same time for, for George Floyd, how George Floyd's image became this symbol uh, of resistance against military and police brutality across the world. Um, yeah, I thought that was fascinating. And I thought it showed really that a lot of countries are dealing with the same thing. A lot of countries are dealing with police brutality and military brutality and um, just not feeling safe in their, within their own communities. And are there other, any other issues that we find just as emotionally attached to? Uh, I think climate change, definitely. Um, feels, I think that one is one where it feels more uh, existentially just frightening because it feels so large and so looming and uh, it really necessitates international global action to uh, to halt climate change. And it's a little frightening to think that that may not happen on the time frame that it's necessary. Joan Johnson is part of my home meeting of Waterford. She's been attending Friends since the 1960s. Here she tells me how she first came to Friends. I wasn't a friend growing up, so that's the answer to that. But my background would have been I was um, a member of the Methodist Church. And we grew up in Dublin, in the centre of Dublin, in Harper Street. And our, our, our church was just around the corner on Stephen's Green. It was called the Centenary Methodist Church. And so that's where we went to church. Uh, so I came from a Methodist background, and it wasn't until I met my husband, Roger, and uh, subsequently married and came to Waterford that um, uh, I became a member, um, and um, have been a member probably since 1968 or 9, when our first child was born and prayed, and um, I, I was very familiar uh, with friends uh, for about six or seven years before that because I had been in touch with them through Roger. So I felt very comfortable by um, applying for membership through Waterford meeting and I've been a member ever since. What was Waterford like in the 60s, Jim? Uh, Waterford in the 60s, from um, the wider perspective, um, we came to Waterford because Roger was teaching at Newtown School 
and Waterford was what I would call a provincial town. Uh, it was um, very pleasant, great amenity, um, but I was born and bred in Dublin. I was uh, trained as a chartered physiotherapist and I was um, used to Dublin way of life. And then we came here and uh, we settled in and, and changed and um, we found it very pleasant to bring our children up. The amenities were very good. Um, uh, we were um, perhaps um, constricted uh, in some way because um, the economics of the country were were quite low. We had a huge um, interest rate at that stage, which was horrendous. Um, I think we were talking about it one the other day. And um, uh, we, uh, so, you know, things were pretty tight. Um, and we had five children. We went to Newton School. And um, uh, there were sacrifices we had to make for that. But um, uh, we were, for us personally, we were living in the Quaker community in Wolford. And we went to the big, large, old, dilapidated meeting house in the Connell Street. I will remember it to this day, 1965. We married, and that's where we went on Sunday. And um, it was um, it was out of date for us, a uh, um, huge monstrosity of a place. But um, there was no Sunday school room. Um, in fact, the Sunday school they had in the ladies' cloak room. Uh, we had a, a, a great group of young married um, couples that were coming to meetings and um, there was a move then that um, possibly that building was out of date for us and subsequently in, in the 19, late 1970s um, there was a move um, and again things moved slowly in Quaker circles but eventually a new meeting house was built on the grounds of Newtown School and the big building was then um, sold to the Waterford City Council and now is a beautiful uh, art centre uh, called Garter Lane Art Centre and so that was um, our new meeting and it was uh, purpose built and we were um, and uh, we were their children in within the Quakers community uh, there and um, it was worked very well. Have you noticed the meeting has grown much over the years? Was it quite small when you arrived? Or uh, have you noticed much changes in, in how it's developed over the years? Yes, I would notice that uh, all the, and, and I might talk about this, the Quaker social history in, in a few minutes, but when we came, uh, there were quite a number of the old Quaker Waterford merchant names there, such as um, the Jacobs and the Hills, to take for example. Um, and there were quite a lot of elderly people. And then we came, and then there was uh, quite a number, maybe five or six uh, married couples with uh, young families. Um, and when we moved to the new meeting house, we got energized, I think, really. And um, uh, there was, now I don't know what the present numbers are, but I think it's been fairly safe. If you look back um, in the 1790s, that big meeting house in O'Connell Street was built. I think the membership was, was quite much higher. Uh, but now it seems to be, uh, in, in this current situation, in the last, say, five to ten, there's a new um, quest, I think, for young, young families, uh, parents, to find somewhere to put a framework for their spiritual growth. And possibly it's a fallout from their disenchantment of the Catholic Church and all that's going on in recent times. 
is to talk to them, go to the Catholic Church in the mall, but yet they are searching for something else. And so we have quite a few um, new young uh, parents and families. For example, our Sunday school is, is, is quite vibrant. Do you know how far back Quakers date with, in terms of their um, connection to Waterford? How far does it go back? Yeah, they came here in 1654-55 and they settled in Waterford. Yeah, so that, they go back a long time. To, and um, they came uh, through the port from the UK. And mainly, the, the ones that came to Waterford were mainly um, what we would call current in current terms, uh, refugees, they came with pretty well nothing except skills as um, labourers and farm workers uh, and um, they settled in Waterford and I have done a fair amount of, of research on, on this aspect and they settled within the walls of, of the old city walls of Waterford and in, in, in a near White Park uh, area and Within 50 years, they had their own meeting house. They had their own burial ground, uh, first one, and they, they started to um, settle uh, and, um, and subsequently economically contribute to the city of Washington. 50 years before they got their first meeting house. That seems, that seems like quite a relatively short space of time before they, before they got settled. Well, yes. Well, well, when they when they first settled, um, they would have met in their own homes, uh, and they would have had meetings for worship in their own homes. Um, but um, and 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 also they would ha they were very keen on education, so they would have homeschooled <laughs> um, for a, a good length of time as well. Um, and so they, they had they had. Um, a, a meeting house um, down down near the Cork Road. It's called Bowling Bowling Lane Alley, and um, and they stayed there on uh, and uh, were very comfortable there. And they had a burial ground quite near. And of course, that is one of the things around Ireland. There's there's quite a few burial grounds, and you think, oh, now why why do they put it? Well, they could. To, they weren't allowed to go into the other um, graveyards or cemeteries because of their, their strongly held beliefs of well, they shouldn't baptize the children and so they weren't allowed in and uh, so they had to set up their burial grounds. And we have the Quaker records of, of the first burial ground and the second one and the third one. So we have three, three here. And it's a fascinating um, a social history there. But so, so in around 1791, from their small meeting house down in Bowling Alley Lane, they then uh, built this very big, big. And you think, how on earth can they do that? It's, but by that, that, that's nearly 150 years later from when they came. They had become such successful in business uh, in, in the city. Mm -hmm. And do you have any sense of what kind of impact Newtown made when it first arrived in the, in the late 1700s? Newtown School? Sure. Um, well, well, the school was set up primarily for um, the children of, of, of Quakers in Munster. And, uh, um, and also mainly for those who who couldn't afford to go anywhere uh, or pay for it. So um, the wealthy friends paid for the upkeep of, of Newtown School, really, because it was very simple so, uh, at that stage. And um, to start with, I think there was pretty well uh, how would I explain it? Um, Newtown was a sort of an enclave of Quakerism education in, in Waterford. They didn't 
uh, to my knowledge, uh, really be a part of or looked upon from the outside as being quite um, exclusive uh, and the new town community kept within the same um, walls as it were. So it didn't make an in impact on, on the city. What did make an impact were the people who were, were working in the city, the Quaker merchants who would have been working in the city, for example, the, the shipbuilders, the Malcolmsons, the Ten Roses, the White. I have a book uh, here which is the shipbuilders of of uh, Waterford from 1820 to 1882. It's full of the Quaker um, heritage of shipbuilding in, in Waterford. And so you have the, the shipbuilders, you have the pe Ten Roses, um, the Brownman, the Brewery, and all those, and I mentioned them, all of those people would have been on the Newtown School Committee and would have managed the school. So, uh, but at that stage, in the, in the 1798 when it started, um, the Quakers in, in the school um, w were pretty um, enclaved, as it were, in, in, inside the walls, as it were. There was very little communication. But that has changed now. That has changed. But to the start, that was it. Because they were a disciplined group at that stage. And you went through the quietism and the strict rules of discipline. For example, within the community, uh, they didn't allow the, the young people to marry out. And to me, that's a tragedy. Um, Do you know why? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because they want they they were so strict and against the the church and the the rituals that they saw of um, the sacraments, the baptism. I mean, it goes back to George Fox, who said, who was so uh, disillusioned with the church um, in the 1600s that he spoke out and wanted to really peel away and get back to the essence of the the message of Jesus. Um, and he felt that over the years, um, layers and layers, it's like an onion, had been put by the, and um, the church had been institutionalized. And he said that the message uh, had uh, gone into the authority of the church and the institution and the corruption. So he was calling out in the 1600s for um, a really simple and um, basic message to, uh, that had been lost, he felt. And so he, and lost because the rituals, for example, of baptism, of Holy Communion, and um, on the feast days of, of the church, um, he felt they should be removed. And so he, as uh, you know, uh, started uh, the religious society then. And so the, the Quaker worship and all its strongly held beliefs of honesty and equality and religious tolerance were the foundation of these new wars for Quakers here. And um, in order to hold on to those, and I said we're talking about 150 years later, the older people in the meeting felt they must restrict the young people and not have them move away um, and be married, for example, in front of what they called a priest. That would be in the Church of Ireland or the Catholic. And if they did, there were sanctions, and the sanction was they were disowned, which to me was a tragedy, looking at it from my perspective here. And we lost a huge amount of our money. And so from a big meeting house in, in the 1790s, which would have been full, that the membership started to fade away. And it's one of the tragedies, I think. It didn't happen this year, it happened in the UK as well. Um, but basically, that's the 
them, the, 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 the third generation, uh, the elders of the, were, were trying to uh, discipline their, their, their flock, as it were, to keep it, it, it adhere to the strict rules of, for example, of gambling and going out to dances. And I have um, the social history of one poor girl, Dorothy of Penrose, and she was going, she fancied going out to dances. Um, and uh, she was disowned. Oh. Uh, and that's a far cry, I think, from what we are today. But we did go through the strict um, uh, years. Uh, not only in Waterford, but it, and all you have to do is look up to the disownment uh, lists which you find in the Friends of Dorothy uh, Library, and I think they're online now, uh, uh, to see the, the uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people who, who were removed from the thing. Just in terms of their arrival in the mid 1650s, mm. um, had many Quakers settled down this part of the country before then? Were they kind of a first in some ways? Had Quakerism spread that further that further south prior to that? Well, from my research, um, the answer is no. That they would the, the first ones that came out from from the UK, and that was due, as we well know, to the the civil. Um, uh, problems over there and religion. There was a lot of dissenters, you see, speaking out. There was um, the Baptist and, and George Fox and, and others. Um, and because they, they were speaking out, of course, they, they were uh, viewed as anti-royalists and a lot of them were put in jail. And so um, that filtered down to the effect they had on, on families and wives and children and some of them said, right, we're going to, to emigrate. And so we're talking about them arriving here uh, and as far as I know, they were the first, they weren't settlers here, but it was a port from Bristol, you see. They either came from, from Bristol to, to Waterford, Cork or, or Dublin. And so the, the ones that settled here in Waterford were the first ones. Yeah, they were the first ones. And do you get a sense of the community being surprised by just how much of a mark they made in the community? As a collection of, of yeah. uh, you know, very skilled workers. Well, they didn't make a much of an impression at the beginning. And some of them, actually, I, ha I have the, the uh, research done on some of the, the people who came who would, as George Fox would have gone into a church and actually challenged the, the minister uh, in the, um, while he was giving his sermons. And, um, and uh, this happened here in Warford or outside the churches. And they would have looked, been looked at by the authorities as nuisances. And some of them are packed off and sent back to the UK. But there's only a few instances of that, and generally speaking, they were settled and welcomed. And they were hard, they became known as hard working, honest people. And that, I think, is the key to how they settled because they were, as I say, small craftsmen and, and laborers. And they, they worked, they had a good work ethic. And uh, gradually, over the first, say, 50 years, they gradually settled and started to make inroads into the into the community, and that is how I think their businesses started to flourish. Um, uh, and also, they were allied to uh, somewhat to the Catholics who were under the penal laws as well. So they had comrades as it were there. Uh, in Warford and were supported by them too. So um, they settled anyway and um, made the mark. And just in terms of today, do you get a sense of the community and how it fits into the city life today? Oh, I think it has um, has has uh, developed over the years. There's no doubt about that. 
and it's in the intervening years that um, once the, the quake has settled and within 150 years they had um, become, they had set up their own businesses and that's an integral part of the development of Quakers in, in Waterford to this day. Uh, so while they were down off the Cork Road and in, in their small little houses there, by third generation then they, you, if you study them you'll see they have progressed into shipbuilding, into uh, merchants, um, and I have actually just uh, last year done um, a little history of the of the, the Quaker merchants and the influence that they they made, and that is recognised uh, today. So you have the families such as the Penroses, the Whites, the Grubs, the Peets, and the Chapmans, the Bells, all active around the Keys. So they have moved down to where the businesses were, uh, the hubbub of the keys um, and the comings and goings of the ships there. So you had the Quaker merchants there and they were contributing by giving employment. Uh, they were uh, living over their businesses there. And also, um, not only that, they were contributing to the the poor, the poverty, and the relief work they did then. Uh, so they were only making successful businesses, but they were also very aware of of trying to contribute to alleviate the, the relief, uh, the poverty in Waterford. Um, the other thing is because they lived simply, and this is still this was still a trade then, they. They didn't build their lavish houses. They lived over the shop. What profit they made, in simple terms, went back into the business to improve it and also um, help to employ more people. Uh, and that that is a big factor because often, and you can see it, people, these companies make business. And the, uh, and the other thing is the, the companies were owned by the, the families. So some families would have been, well, Quaker families would have done what I've said, but others might have built palatial houses, bought, um, bought estates or, or, and so on, and, and plowed the money outside. But the Quakers um, did otherwise. And that, um, to answer your original question, and then of course the famine, they made a huge contribution there, and um, I've written about that, uh, and the Quaker contribution. Um, but today, I think, it is suddenly dawning on the city fathers how much uh, the contribution that Quakers made was is valued now, but it's taken a while. It's taken. Before we finish, I must ask you about the the trail that's emerged in the last couple of years. Oh yes, well you see, um, the the Quaker Trail is is a guide to um, to visitors, the visitors or local people who want to find out more about the Quakers, Waterford Quaker story, as it were, or the heritage of Waterford Quakers, um, they, they now can, can get a little map, and it, I've identified um, about 14 different uh, locations where the Quakers were around the Keys and the road parallel to it called O'Connell Street, so like a rectangular walk. So this leaflet is available uh, locally in, in shops and through the museum, etc. And, and people can take it and then walk around this trail. And uh, there's um, about 14 locations and there's a little text 
uh, it's a, quite a, a graphic thing. So, um, and they can then see what um, the story is of, of the different locations. Uh, so we hope that. And the thing that pleased me about that too was that um, the city council um, funded that. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and I think that's something that is important. That a lot of researchers or people like yourself, for example, mm -hmm. um, have to invest time in doing this research mm -hmm. and so on. And I and I think we don't put enough emphasis on the value of that. Mm -hmm. So I was very pleased it was funded, and I was actually paid for that job. It's the first job I've ever been paid um, to do. Uh, I, I, I've written two two books. I've, I've also written a chapter on the famine in Warsford, and it's all been. And I, I was quite happy to give that time free, but I think things are changing, and we we had a conversation quite <laughs> back about this that I think um, we have to value uh, research and the written word, and so the uh, city council did. Good penny actually for it, and uh, and I think that also tells the story that the city council um, uh, are interested in the heritage and the heritage of war. I get a real sense of pride just as hearing you talk about it, Joan. I get a real sense of pride that this is a uh, this is part of the story of Waterford. Is that fair to say? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I I would think um, I I would think I'm very happy to share this knowledge. Um, and I'm in a particular situation that I never thought I'd be in. And it's, that, that's something that, yeah, I trained as a child physiotherapist. And I had a career down here um, when I was rearing my family. And then times changed, and I, became, I had always an interest in history. Um, but uh, it, this was a sort of process of osmosis. And I became interested in what was in the the nineteen ninety six and the commemoration of the famine uh, that I realized that Morris Rhythm had been nurturing my interest in this um, and uh, worked with him uh, on a few small projects and then he went he, he passed away, and I sort of then slipped into this uh, role uh, I'm not a trained historian. I'm not an archivist, but I, I am proud to look after uh, the safekeeping of the records that we have in Waterford Newton and also in the school. Huge. And it's because, because the Quakers have kept their records. And we have those wonderful records going back to 1798 when the foundation of the school. And they're all meticulously written out. And my my biggest pride would be to well we have them all now digitized. That that's in this day and age it's wonderful. And they're they're accessible uh, through the school um, on request. And uh, so I am I am proud of, 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 to be honest with you of the contribution that I I I I can make uh, and also to um, respond to emails of requests for information, and um, but it's access. And as I said, and we have our, our records digitized here. Uh, we have the monthly meeting records digitized. Uh, we have the birth, marriages, and death register uh, digitized. And um, so they are accessible to some extent. In other words, we have copies uh, of those. It's now to, to um, get them in some way out into uh, a, a more public domain. And that's the bit that I wouldn't be familiar with because, um, uh, how to do that. But anyway, we have them digitized, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I can refer and look up stuff. So I, I am proud. But I am proud of the, the fact that Waterford Quakers, and especially uh, the, the evolving situation at Newtown, is now 
a, a preschool. Uh, it's under the um, secondary school um, government scheme. So, um, because if you look at the history, it started off as just Quaker only school uh, children there, and it had to be funded and was funded by the the, the uh, Quaker merchants and, and Munster merchants and friends, and then um, then it was open to uh, non friends, and then um, then fees had to be paid. And over, I suppose, maybe 80 to 100 years, those fees started to go up and up and up. And then it became a private fees paying school. But now, Newtown has moved into this more open, diverse school, which certainly I'm proud of, uh, what the Quakers are proud of, that is now open and um, is non fee paying. Just one last question before uh, before we finish. Um, what have you found to be the most striking change changes that the early meeting has gone through over the past while? Oh, um, I have to think about that one. Well, there's no no doubt about it that um, I think we have been come more inclusive and. Um, working through the diversity of Ireland's um, community, for example, uh, the gay community. I think that, that was a big step to accept that. And I know that um, that had to be worked through um, and respecting people's strongly held views on that. Um, and for example, last year we had a, a wedding uh, uh, down in Maidenhead. Um, and I remember being at the monthly meeting where, where the uh, marriage application was, was uh, produced and, and asked if could, could they have a, this wedding of two gay men. And um, it, went with, it uh, went through without question. Without question. So uh, that, that that would indicate to me that um, I referred to those elders in the se late seventeen hundreds who were so disciplined and and um, inward looking. How much we had changed and developed. Um, I think that 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 would be one of the most important changes that we had. I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to do always when I, have, I give talk to people, and I do when I give presentations, and there's more of those being asked about, which is, I think is great because people are now uh, looking, looking outward uh, uh, and wanting to know about the papers, uh, which is a new thing. 20 years, 30 years ago, I would have never given these talks. My point is that whenever I talk, I try to make the, the, uh, the answers to the question as simple as possible for people to, because you know, kids that don't know about culture, you know, they don't, they don't. And I think that is one of the, the criticisms of Albert Hansen, that we're, we're not good at promoting ourselves. And we do great work, I mean, Absolutely great work. We don't promote ourselves. And with that, we reach the end of another episode of the Friendly Podcast. Thanks for listening. Don't forget you can subscribe to our social channels. And if you'd like to find out more about Quakers in Ireland, you can find us online at quakers.ie.